Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you all for joining today for the Brookings Governance Studies Virtual Conference on Voting Rights and Wrongs, Democracy Legislation in the Senate. This two panel discussion, first uh, two of our most distinguished United States senators, and then outstanding political and social scientists on the second panel, comes at a consequential time in the never finished history of American democracy. Last year, a full throttle assault was launched on one of our most sacred institutions, the foundation really of our democratic republic, free and fair elections, a barrage of false claims, uh, dangerous and inflammatory rhetoric, unwarranted challenges and frivolous lawsuits that led to the violent insurrection in the Capitol on January 6th. And unfortunately, it's not over. That same animus now powers hundreds of voter suppression bills in 43 states across our land. However, we'll talk about this shortly on our first panel. Congress is also tackling the urgent need for electoral and ethics reform with its consideration of Senate Bill 1, the For the People Act that passed the House as HR 1 earlier this month. Uh, S1 contains many of the reforms that my co-authors and I wrote about in our new Brookings report just released, If It's Broke, Fix It. While under our Brookings rules, I'm not permitted to endorse any particular piece of legislation, I am free to endorse the, I don't think our senators will be uh, constrained by that since the Brookings rules do not apply to them. Uh, I am, even I am free to endorse the moment we're in. It is a historic generational moment. Its outcome, whatever that may be, will be of enormous consequence, consequence for the trajectory of our democracy and our nation. So for our first panel coming straight to us at Brookings Governance Studies, from the first Senate hearing on the For the People Act, we're very fortunate to have with us both Senator Amy Klobuchar and Senator Jeff Merkley to talk about these issues. As you all know, Senator Klobuchar represents Minnesota and is the chairwoman of the Senate Rules Committee, where she oversaw today's historic and there were a lot of interesting and surprising moments that we'll talk about uh, on today's uh, hearing during today's hearing on S1. Senator Klobuchar also sits on the Agriculture, Commerce, and Judiciary Committees and has served the Senate since 2006 as the first elected female U.S. Senator from Minnesota. Senator Jeff Merkley was elected to the Senate to represent Oregon in 2008. He serves on Appropriations, Environment and Public Works, Foreign Relations, Rules, where he was outspoken today, uh, and the Budget Committee, uh, together with Senator Klobuchar, Senator Merkley has led the effort on uh, S-1 and, and was a prominent voice uh, at today's hearings. I've had the privilege of discussing these issues with both of them over a period of years. And I could tell uh, our viewers that um, uh, there are no two senators who are more deeply and personally committed uh, to government reform and electoral reform and ethics reform than the two who are joining me today for our first panel. With that, I'm going to turn to our guests. Uh, let me remind you all that you will have your chance uh, to ask questions as well. You can submit them for speakers by emailing events at brookings.edu or on Twitter, which we're watching uh, using hashtag for the People Act. So uh, senators, uh, welcome to Brookings. We're so honored to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, as, I, uh, as I noted in my opening, uh, there are more than 250 voter suppression bills uh, speeding through state legislatures, uh, even after the um, uh, over 60 court cases proved that there was no electoral fraud. We're still hearing that canard and so many others. And even after the violence of January 6th, can, can I ask you each um, to reflect on the moment we're in and your view about the need 
uh, for Senate Bill 1. Uh, some of the members and the witnesses who are opposed to the bill uh, made something of the fact today uh, that it is Senate Bill Number 1. Uh, can you explain also why Congress is prioritizing it? Senator Klobuchar, we'll start with you. Well, thank you so much, Norm. Thank you to Brookings, and thanks for that uh, great report. If it's broke, fix it. Did I get that right? You got it. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, thanks to my friend Jeff. And by the way, it's not just leadership uh, out there on camera. It's what he's doing behind the scenes, uh, working so hard every day. The other day, I told him something that had made me happy. And I said, I'm in good mood. And how about you? And he said, this is just the two of us. I will never be happy until we pass this bill. Okay, so that is true devotion to this bill. Um, and so the point of why this matters right now is, as you said, Norm, it's been a year uh, onslaught of, of attacks on our democracy, culminating in a literal attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And if you didn't think we had to get serious about democracy, then I don't know what's going to motivate you. And as I said two weeks later, when we reclaimed that space on the inaugural stage, despite the spray paint at the bottom of the columns and the makeshift windows that we were in front of, that it is a moment where our democracy must pick itself off, brush itself off, and move forward as we always do, one nation, under God indivisible uh, with liberty and justice for all. That's what this is about. You cannot have as uh, Reverend Warnock, now Senator Warnock, which is amazing from the state of Georgia said in his maiden speech on the floor. Um, if you wanna summarize what's been going on since January 1st, some people don't want some people to vote. And we have a political party, sadly, that doesn't represent all of their voters, doesn't represent people like Trevor Potter, who testified for the bill today, the former Republican chair of the FEC. Uh, but you have literally, instead of coming up, when you lose a national election, like they did, usually you say, hmm, what new issues do we need to focus on? What position should we change? How do we change our messages? How do we reach out to people? Their answer is to double down at CPAC and then to say, but let's just lop off some of those voters uh, so we can win. That's just not going to cut it. And what this bill does is to go through these pillars of trust in our democracy and make sure that we literally take the best practices from states like Michigan, Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary of State testified today, or Minnesota, other places. Let's make it easier for people to vote. Uh, let's make sure that there's trust in our government by doing things to reduce the dark money. And then let's have some ethics back in our government. And as we have many times, upgrade our laws. Uh, that's what this is about. And um, I just end by saying they had a lot of weird arguments today, Norm, that hopefully we will have a chance to knock down, but that they didn't know the bill. Excuse me. It's been out there for a few years and H.R. 1 was introduced in January. They could literally have read a few pages a day and gotten through it. Um, and uh, the second one was that there is somehow fraud when we know it's more likely to be you're hit by lightning than election fraud. And the third was that somehow this would be chaos. And I'll end with that. Chaos chaos is people standing in line for five hours just waiting to vote. Chaos is purging people from voting rolls like they were doing in Georgia when Stacey Abrams was up, longtime voters just getting them rid of them off the rolls. Uh, chaos is one mail drop-off box uh, for your ballot per county when you have a county the size of Harris County in Texas with 5 million people. Chaos is passing a bill that according to a conservative circuit court um, literally discriminates with surgical precision against African-Americans. And chaos is the voters in Wisconsin standing in the rain in homemade garbage bags just trying to vote. That's chaos. Chaos is what you saw on January 6th at the Capitol. And what our bill does, as you say, is fix it. Senator Merkley, uh, over to you for um, uh, uh, the moment that we're in, um, the necessity for Senate one and, and why the uh, Senate is prioritizing this as the very first bill. Oh, and Senator, you'll need to remove your mute. Thank, Thank you. you. Norm, our founders had a very radical proposition 
which was that power would not flow from kings down, but from the people up. And the thing that symbolized that was the, the ballot box. And that is just the pulsating heart of our republic. And we've been fighting over that ballot box for 200 years. We had to fight to get the 14th and 15th amendments passed that took care of some of the barriers for uh, members of, of minorities to be able to participate and the 19th Amendment for women to be able to participate in the ballot, the 1924 uh, Indian Citizenship Act for Native Americans, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And we really thought we'd achieve this vision where we all understand that every citizen gets to participate. And here we are in this moment where there are multiple strategies trying to really corrupt the election system at the heart of our democracy. And one of those is cut people off in the ballot box. Uh, we know how easy it is to manipulate election day to make the people you don't want to vote stand in line for five hours because you don't have very many precinct voting places or you understaff it or you put bad equipment in it or you give them wrong information about where it's located. Uh, we know that. And so therefore, vote by mail, automatic voter registration, early voting are central to stopping the barriers that are put up to prevent, prevent people from voting. And throughout our history, uh, this strategy has been directed against the poor and particularly against black Americans. It's a significant form of systemic uh, racism. And now we have all these voter suppression laws uh, piling on around the country, uh, trying to do that very thing, block the ballot box. So we're in the fight to protect that. We take an oath to the constitution, we're going to defend it. And then there's other assaults. And one of them is gerrymandering, which attacks equal representation. And we all have a stake in what Congress looks like, not just the people from our own state, but to know that there's integrity in the other states, which is why the founders put into the Constitution a clause giving our ability by law to be able to set the terms and conditions of voting for senators and House members, because we all have a stake, not just the integrity of our state, but of every single state. And then the dark money hundreds of millions of dollars that we don't know where it comes from. You and I make a donation, a couple hundred dollars to a candidate, we are disclosed. But if a multi-billionaire gives $10 million through a PAC, they're anonymous. And you don't know where those attack ads are coming from. So we are defending the very foundation for what makes our republic a country that serves the vision of government of, by, and for the people. Um. The um, we're going to dive into those three pillars of um, Senate Bill One of the For the People Act: uh, voting, campaign finance, lifting up small dollar donations, and and ethics. And the, as you say, they're tied together. All three go to the core of the American idea, which is um, that our country is an expression of every individual American. And these are three different ways, whether it's if your vote is blocked or there's a barrier, if your voice is drowned out by huge dark money instead of small donations being amplified. And if the people you choose get into the White House and run willy nilly all over the rule of law and the ethics rules, they're not abiding by the will of the people either. So we're gonna get into those three pillars, but I wanna step out. Uh, Senator Klobuchar told us that wonderful uh, story about uh, Senator Merkley. And I want to ask each of you so deeply committed to this piece of legislation, and we could see it when we watch today. Um, um, I want to ask each of you if there's a, a personal moment uh, from your careers or your lives that informs uh, the work that you're doing uh, on S1. Just, uh, we, we, just to before we dive into the policy, just to humanize this um, effort that you're embarked upon for our viewers. And Senator Klobuchar, we'll start with you. And you have to unmute again. I fear that I've sentenced Jeff to never act happy now until we pass the bill. Um, He's a happy warrior. I know. He's it's a like happy warrior. Humphrey. Um, from an emotional standpoint, uh, you think about what this bill means when you stand with jo John Lewis, uh, the last public event he had on that bridge in Selma, um, and the scar on his head and what people went through 
uh, just to be able to keep that right to vote. Uh, from a personal standpoint, just my own experience, and I know Jeff has that, of being stopped by big interests so you can't pass sensible bills like uh, background checks for guns or uh, do a climate change bill, like something that, you know, renewable electricity standard that was passed in Minnesota with Governor Pileni's support, but we couldn't get it done because of uh, big money in politics. Um, and then just from uh, one last amusing thing I'd say, as someone like Jeff that doesn't come from money uh, when I ran for office, I know this about Jeff because when he was campaigning for Senate, I went out there and helped and was in his car with him. And he, in the last week, was driving around with a crack in the windshield. And I called Schumer. I'm like, you got to help this guy. He actually might win. Um, and uh, I... Um, uh, my own personal story is that what uh, the office I ran for, you could only county attorney that I had, you could only get up to 500 bucks and from an individual donor. So when I start running for Senate, no one will call me back nationally. They can't pronounce my name. I finally just give up and I go through my old address books and other things. And I call everyone I know in my life. And that is when I set what is still an all time U.S. Senate record. I raised $17,000 from ex-boyfriends. And as my husband has pointed out, it's not an expanding base. And so when you come from that kind of place uh, where uh, you didn't have a lot of money or you couldn't put your own money in a race, that makes it real uh, that you believe that people should be able to run for office uh, that don't have access to big bucks. I could raise a great deal of money from my exes, but only for my opponents. <laughs> uh, Senator Merkley. What's a personal moment for you? You know, I was thinking about how I just loved the vision growing up of a republic where because every citizen has a voice, you end up doing the things that really are meaningful for families to thrive. Education, healthcare, housing, living wage jobs. And I came out of high school in the mid seventies and my parents uh, would talk about how they'd gone from living in, in shacks and extraordinarily difficult conditions, including uh, during the Depression, my grandmother uh, being in a railroad car, uh, and the huge leap forward. And I thought, think about what's going to happen in our lifetimes as we build on this foundation of the three decades after World War II. And what I have watched is that as the power in our election system has changed, we have failed to create those foundations for families to thrive, healthcare, housing, education, living wage jobs. And I thought, we have to fix these things before my kids are out of high school. And then they got out of high school. And I thought, before they get out of college, and now they're out of, out, of, out of college. And I wrestled last year with whether to run for re-election because the Senate is so broken, so controlled by powerful interests, and thought, you know, if I run again, I'm going to do everything I can to make this place work. Uh, and it's kind of like those signs that you put on, on wagons and when people were going west, it was like uh, Oregon or bust. In this case, it's reform or bust. We have to protect the election system. We have to fix the broken Senate where Mitch McConnell has a veto over every good thing we try to do. Um, the time is flying by. I'm going to do a little bit of a personal lightning round, and then I'm going to open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, Senator Klobuchar, a quick highlight and low light of today's hearing for you. Uh, well, I would say the, uh, the low light was just um, all the things that were said that were not true about this bill, the implications that somehow... Uh, people who weren't citizens would be able to vote. That's just not true. Or uh, the implications that um, it was not okay that people who have uh, served their time and are no longer in prison, the people of Florida voted uh, to allow uh, people with felony convictions to vote um, under those circumstances, including a whole bunch of Republicans. Um, and then just the, uh, the untruths about fraud and those kinds of things, which we've heard before. Um, I'd say some of the best moments, uh, we're seeing Attorney General hold their back. That was nice. Um, seeing Jocelyn Elder, Stellan, jo Jocelyn Benson stand up for the simple idea of the Secretary of State of Michigan, the simple idea that uh, you can um, uh, 
uh, get all these things done. Uh, that she just completely debunked these stories that the state couldn't do it because she did it in a year. And then finally, I, as I noted, uh, Trevor Potter, you know, to as a Republican to come forward and say this is not going to necessarily help one party or the other. It just helps people to vote. Actually, Republicans won in some of the states where they had high voter turnout, states like Montana. So I just think those basic arguments uh, that we were able to refute their arguments, that was my, I guess, my low and my high point. Uh, Senator Merkley, what about you? Well, the issue of automatic voter registration came up quite a bit. And Ted Cruz says this is a deliberate strategy to allow millions of non-citizens to be able to vote. And then uh, Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary of State of Michigan, who implemented automatic voter registration, I was able to ask her, how many people in Michigan did this expand the vote to? And she said about a quarter million, 250,000 people. That's a really cool thing. A quarter million people who hadn't been voting have been tied into the system. And then I said, and so as people have looked closely at this, how many people have they found who were not eligible to vote who voted? And she said, zero. Well, certainly it shows that Ted Cruz's attack, that this is about enabling people who aren't, can't legally vote to vote is just an, an enormous big lie. And it also shows the power of reforms to enable people who have been boxed out or, or, or b barriers have been constructed to keep them out are able to participate when you knock down those barriers. I was also very struck by Secretary Benson's testimony. She's a Brookings author. We've published her here at GS. And uh, Senator Klobuchar's daughter is going to be making law school <laughs> determinations. Uh, she's a Harvard Law School grad. I'm not oh, lobbying. I see. I'm oh, not we'll lobbying, see. Senator. I'm, not, I'm lobbying. not getting involved in her life right now. She's a grown up. Uh, so um, um, with that, we're gonna. I'm gonna ask one last one. Then I'm gonna take our our questions are coming in, and the first one will be from Ron Brownstein at the Atlantic. I would be remiss if I did not ask this question. Um, the uh, there's a, a been a lot of conversation about how the um, Senate is or is not going to come together in your caucus. Uh, will or will not come together around. Um, the bill and in particular about the uh, the fate of the filibuster we'll have much more on this on the second panel but will s1 be the bill that is the filibuster buster senator merkley I'll let, you should let merkley go first and then i'll i'll go senator merkley so i'll tell you i don't i don't know how it's all going to unfold but i believe this all 50 members of our caucus believe in the vision of every american participating in our government and want to want to strike down the barriers. And so they're making all, everyone's making valuable contributions. And we realize that this effort to, to enhance, strengthen the vision of government by and for the people is going to be fought all out by the powerful forces ac across the aisle. And so that means we will have to take on the McConnell veto. I don't like to call it a filibuster because the filibuster implies somebody's on the floor talking, they're doing it in the full light of day. No, this is just a veto by Mitch McConnell over legislation that is in the service of our constitution and the rights of Americans all across our land. So uh, I, the two are intertwined. How this will be resolved? 50 of us will be in a caucus room. We'll wrestle with all the pieces of it. We'll develop a plan. We'll all buy into it and we'll go forward and make it happen. Senator Klobuchar. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I I am in favor of uh, getting rid of the filibuster. You know, I think it was, and I think that uh, we're going to have to figure it out. Even Senator Manchin has said that he's in favor of a talking filibuster, um, which would mean they'd have to put their money where their mouth is and actually stand up and object and speak. Um, to me, when I listened to this hearing today, it just brought home how important this is and why we can't just let everything end up on the cutting room floor of the Senate when people have clearly voted for change. I listened to some of the people um, on the other side talk about the fact that, well, it was a pandemic. So, you know, so we let some people vote in a different way and it worked. Well, why would we now close the door 
It prove, it was proven that the vote by mail that was for the first time brought out in a big way that people didn't have to get all those notary signatures to get a ballot. And now we're going to say to them, yeah, you can do that once, but not again, even though it's a safe way to vote. It makes no sense unless you want to make it hard to vote and hurt our democracy. And so for that reason, as we look at the importance of Senate procedure, I think it was, again, Senator Warnock who said, what are we more worried about? protecting uh, minority rights of some guys sitting in the Senate. There's a lot of guys, sorry, Jeff, or prote protecting minority rights uh, in our country. To me, the answer is obvious. Thank you. And now we'll take the first question from Ron Brownstein at The Atlantic, a shrewd observer <laughs> of these matters for many years. Uh, in light of state suppression efforts, he asked, and I'll direct this to one, Senator or another, would it make sense to strip down the bill to voting rights, voter registration reform, and limits on gerrymandering, a skinny version of the first chapter of the bill? Senator Merkley, does it make sense to chop this bill up, or is there an organic logic to it? Well, there is a strong logic to it. And as the House wrestled with this bill, there were folks said, well, we're not quite sold on, on the idea of a small dollar program. Uh, others have said we're not quite sold on, on addressing gerrymandering. Uh, but then they looked at the composition of the whole and they said, well, I might not buy into every piece of this. I buy into 95% of it. I know it's going to be a vast improvement for America. So it, it welded everyone together in the effort. And that's essential to retain. Yeah, I would say the answer to that, Jeff, is decades, decades of doing nothing on campaign finance reform or voting, not responding as this Congress has not done uh, to the sophisticated nature of the way people are messing around with the campaign laws, undermining uh, congressional intent and not responding to the new force uh, there, social media companies who've made tons of money off of advertising and the Honest Ads Act, which is a, one of nine bipartisan bills in there. This is a bill I have with Senator Graham, um, previously with Senator McCain's bill that requires them to put disclaimers and disclosures just like radio and TV do when you run ads. And so to me, um, it, we have not done anything for so long. And that's what brings this bill together. It's getting at clearly major problems uh, that must be addressed. And, and we're almost out of time for the first panel, but I'm going to I'm going to uh, do one last question. Uh, I'll start with Senator Klobuchar from Dan Weiss. Are there any GOP senators that might might support efforts to remove, remove impediments to voting or other parts of the bill. I know you've, you've, you've been such a strong fighter for bar, bipartisanship over your entire career, Senator Klobuchar. So we'll start that one with you. Well, of course there are. There's nine bipartisan bills in here. Um, and I mentioned one of them. Another one is backup paper ballots. That's a bill that uh, Secure Elections Act that Senator Langford and I did together along with um, uh, Senator Graham was on that bill. Then Senator Harris, um, Senator Warner played a major part in that bill and Senator Burr, the two heads of the Intelligence Committee. Um, and I've had a number of Republicans come up to me and said, oh, I hate the way some of those states didn't start counting until after the election. That's legitimate. It created confusion. Some of them were red states. Some of them were blue states. Some of them were in between. Um, and so that's in that bill to make sure that we start processing ballots. So you never know until you get a bill to the floor. And I guess one way to end my answers here is because we have the gavel for the first time, thanks to those incredible people of Georgia uh, who defied all expectations and voted for us, two incredible senators in Warnock and Ossoff. Um, we have the gavel and we have the opportunity to have hearings like this to get the bill to the floor and begin the debate. We didn't even get to that point uh, forever before this. And I thank Jeff for his work. Senator, I'm gonna come to you for the last short one, a follow up on that from Jared Applewhite. If SB1 does pass with few or no Republican votes, is there a risk of politicizing uh, democracy reform issues for which Senator Klobuchar points out there's actually broad popular support. You know, I was thinking about how during McCain Feingold, where the, the goal was to put a limit on what each person donated to make sure there was a vision of equal representation. Uh, so many uh, uh, colleagues across the aisle said, no, 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 we don't like those, those amounts to be capped. We want, we want disclosure. 
And then after Citizens United, and after they were benefiting from hundreds of millions of dollars of dark money, they're like, oh, those big powerful folks, they don't want disclosure. So we just can't, <laughs> you know, their money funds our campaigns. We can't do that anymore. And then when this was introduced last time, and, and um, it, Mitch McConnell pulled in his caucus, I've been told this by Republican senators, and said, you can't sponsor this bill. You heard this in Mitch McConnell's testimony today, where he essentially dared his members to not support the bill. Uh, like that, you cannot support this bill. And um, uh, so that pressure from the outside forces funding the campaigns and from Mitch McConnell means that those who, who share this goal, this vision of protecting the ballot box of equal representation are under tremendous pressure not to do so. And it's not yet clear that there is any single profile in courage where with those pressures are going to join us on the bill as a whole. I certainly, the door is open. Uh, Amy and I would love to, to have the conversation. We're gonna reach out to Republicans across the aisle, uh, but that's the lay of the land that makes it of diminishing probability that we will have a Republican vote in support of the bill. I wanna thank you both for joining us today at Brookings uh, for your leadership in the Senate, uh, in our nation. Uh, this is not only a domestic issue, the whole, as, as, as a foreign policy person, I know the whole world is looking at these questions to understand the future of the United States. So uh, thank you so much for being with us. We'll look forward to having you back and we'll be watching closely uh, for the next developments on Senate One, the For the People <laughs> Act. Thank you. Thank right. you, Senator. Thanks, Mark. Norm. Thanks, Jeff. Take Bye. Care, And friends, if you'll just stick with us, we're going to bring the second panel on board. I see our brilliant Brookings sociology colleague, Ray Sean Ray. I see the stellar Brookings political scientist, Molly Reynolds, and Norm the Elder, Norm Ornstein, our emeritus political scientist. Uh, from AEI. Uh, Norm uh, Ornstein and I uh, often say we'll start a band, uh, The Ethical Norms, but I guess the next best thing is to do a panel here at, uh, at Brookings Governance Studies. So welcome to the three of you. Uh, more formally, Molly Reynolds is a senior fellow in the Governance Studies program here at Brookings. She studies Congress with an emphasis on how congressional rules and procedure affect domestic policy outcomes. Rayshawn Ray is a David M. Rubenstein Fellow in Governance Studies at Brookings and Professor of Sociology and Executive Director of the Lab for Applied Social Science Research at University of Maryland College Park. And Norm Ornstein is an emeritus scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he's been studying politics, elections, uh, and the United States Congress, and giving me career advice as one of my mentors for more than four decades. Finally, as we launch into this second panel um, on the fate of democracy legislation in the Senate, and uh, including, uh, we heard some very tantalizing uh, uh, predictions about what may happen. I think Senator Klobuchar was, both of our senators were pretty strong in predicting what's gonna happen. Um, uh, um, we will in particular look at the fate of the filibuster on this panel because I have uh, uh, three who have written about it and deep, deep filibuster expertise and different ideas about how to fix uh, or eliminate the filibuster. I'll say right up front uh, that um, I feel confident as much as I personally might like to see the filibuster completely evaporated because I think it is a uh, relic with uh, a shameful history that um, probably you're not gonna see the complete elimination of the filibuster and we can debate that or not, uh, but instead, targeted solutions. Uh, and we will talk about all that. So 
I'm going to start by just going around to my colleagues. Molly, we'll start with you, then Raisha, and then Norm Ornstein. You heard the first panel with the senators. Uh, what jumped out at you? This is a version of my first question to them. I love doing these Brookings event because I can be the uh, poor man's uh, Johnny Carson. Uh, the first question that 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 I uh, that I posed to them: uh, What jumped out at you of what they said that defines this moment that we're in, where the 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 stop the steal lie that resulted in all that chaos and a violent insurrection is continuing in these voter suppression bills, many of them naked uh, return to Jim Crow law, and then colliding with this massive omnibus for the People Act, H.R. 1. We're going to come to a companion piece of legislation coming down the pike, H.R. 4, the John Lewis. We talked about John Lewis on the first panel, the John Lewis um, Voting Rights Act. Um, so this collision, you know, this clash of the titans, what jumped out at you at, at, from the first panel about this moment that we are now in? Molly, starting with you. Yeah, thank you, Norm, um, and thanks for having me. So you just used the sort of metaphor of a clash of the titans. And uh, what I was struck most by was sort of just the to hear the senators reflect on what are the big obstacles that remain to getting um, S1, HR1, uh, you just mentioned uh, the forthcoming HR4, the real obstacles that remain to actually getting those through the Senate in the presence of the Senate filibuster. So we, um, uh, one of the senators referenced um, Leader McConnell's comments at the, at the hearing on S1 today. If there's one thing that we know about Leader McConnell, it's that um, he cares a lot about these kinds of um, electoral issues. Um, uh, they're right up there with, with judges as things that really motivate him as the Republican leader in the Senate. And so we have these this hugely important piece of legislation, so many um, moving parts to it. Um, the senator's response to Ron Brownstein's question about, you know, might we break this up into different parts? And they both said, we really need to do all of it. Um, that's a that's a lot of material, um, a lot of really important um, meat in this legislation, and it it really does seem to me to be on a, a direct collision course with the filibuster. And then, and I think we're going to talk about this on on this panel. What happens? What do we do about that? Okay, Ray Sean, what jumped out at you that illustrates this critical moment that our country is in? And by saying that, I'm not endorsing any particular solution. In our report, we laid out some of the solutions that are needed, not in terms of particular legislation, but in terms of policy. Uh, uh, what leapt out at you from the first panel? Yeah, well, Norm, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm excited about this continued conversation. I mean, when I think about what we saw today and what we've been seeing, not only over the past several weeks, but over the past several months, if we actually compare what some people are saying on the Senate floor to what we would hear six or seven decades ago, where we would see people aiming to block civil rights legislation is very reminiscent. And oftentimes we need to have that comparison because I think that some of the things that we've been hearing on the Senate floor, um, history is not gonna be too kind to, to the things that we've heard. So as we move forward into the future and people reflect back, I think it's gonna be a lot of discussion. I mean, for me, as I was hearing some of the statements that were made and thinking about if I was teaching undergraduates right now, how would I explain to them what uh, older adults were saying to try to justify oftentimes the, the inability for people to be able to go out and vote? And I think that's what's key. I mean, when we look at the 2020 election, I mean, more people came out to vote, Democrat and Republicans. And when we really think about um, how it relates to the Jim Crow South. We can go back to the 1950s. I think it was the 19, what well, it ended up being the 1958 Civil Rights Bill. And Strom Thurmond, who people know was a staunch segregationist, he actually read the phone book on the Senate floor. And how did he do that for, for about 24 hours? Well, he went to the sauna <laughs> and literally <laughs> aimed to drain the water and the liquid from his body so we, he wouldn't have to use the restroom. Like this is how much people actually don't wanna see people be able to vote. And we have to be 
very honest, oftentimes they don't want to see uh, people of color vote. They oftentimes don't want to see immigrants vote, even people who are legal citizens. And so we really have to get down to the crutch of what was going on. And through all of the noise, that was what I heard on the Senate floor is that unfortunately, some people, some, some of our elected officials don't actually want to see some people really be able to express and embrace what it means to be American. Yeah, as, as, as Senator Klobuchar, I think, quoted on the first panel, some people don't want some people to vote. Uh, Norm Ornstein, we've been in these battles together. Uh, the policy trenches for many, many years. Uh, I think it is an apocalypse moment, one of those like the 1964 Civil Rights Act, one of the one of those moments when you just feel the uh, the change gathering in Washington, in addition to analyzing it. Uh, so um, what jumped out at you uh, from that first panel that sheds light on the on, on the moment we're in? Uh, thanks, Norman. Uh, Rashawn, I can't uh, uh keep myself from noting that at one point I interviewed Strom Thurmond and we were talking about uh, that uh, 24 hour uh, filibuster. And uh, he said, Hubert Humphrey and all these other Democrats kept coming up and offering me orange juice and uh, colas and other things to drink. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, I have to ask you a blunt question, uh, Senator Thurmond, did you have a catheter? And he kind of laughed and smirked and said, I'm not telling. Uh, so uh, those were different days. Um, a couple of things that jumped out at me today, Norm. Uh, one was a comment made by uh, Deb Fisher, the senator from Nebraska Republican, who said, well, of course, all of us want to make it easier to vote and to have more people voting. And I thought that was a bit like Hannibal Lecter saying, well, of course, all of us want to have a vegan diet. Um, it didn't pass any laugh test at all. And it reflected what we saw in this hearing from every single Republican including Roy Blunt, who I've worked with in issues before, who is, has a very good relationship with Amy Klobuchar, who's retiring, but who is uh, obdurately opposed to this bill. They all are because voter suppression now is their signature. Um, they're not, as Amy said, uh, not looking after losing an election to altering policies or trying to reach out to a broader group of voters. And it's striking if you look at Georgia, where the Georgia Republicans enacted a series of laws to make voting by mail easier because that was their wheelhouse, their voters. And when it didn't work that way this time, now they're trying to repeal the laws that they put in place. And we've had Georgia election officials say directly, well, you know, if we keep this up, we're going to get all these people voting the way we don't want them to vote. So there is a level of honesty here, but what we also heard in this hearing today was a level of disingenuousness of flatly saying things. Senator Merkley pointed out um, uh, Ted Cruz talking about the tens of millions of illegal aliens who could vote under this bill. That tells us the bottom line here, which is there will not be a Republican vote for this bill and it's gonna to have to pass by changing the Senate rules if anything is gonna be done. But what's also clear is with 50 Democrats alone, getting this entire bill, having it enacted as a package is not likely to happen. There are gonna be objections raised by Joe Manchin and possibly others. And I would make one other point on this too. Democrats also need to be very careful. We have a Supreme Court that has shown itself to be hostile to voting rights starting with John Roberts, who wrote Shelby County. And they better make sure that all of the provisions of this bill are severable so that you don't put a package together if you finally make it through and have the Supreme Court scrap the whole thing because of one or two pieces that don't meet their test. And I'll point out that the um, ire that Norm Ornstein, who was one of the first to warn me, when I was working in the Obama White House in the early days about the asymmetrical dysfunction. In fact, I got a copy of his and Tom Mann's book to President Obama. He, he, he warned us that there was an asymmetry and it's not a partisan question. I do a lot of work in my 501c3 voter protection 
program that I chair with former governor, co-chair with former governor, former Bush cabinet secretary, Christy Todd Whitman. And there are a vast number on both sides of the aisle. I think there are people of good faith who are very concerned. I wrote this report. If it's broke, fix it. Uh, one of the co-authors was my Bush era um, White House equivalent, Richard Painter, who's actually an extreme conservative. Um, but there is a kind of asymmetrical dysfunction that has organized around this idea. And some of those who are the most agitated about it are those who with the deepest and strongest GOP roots, like uh, Governor Whitman, that um, um, we, we are going to uh, uh, erect barriers to voting, new barriers to voting. We're going to reverse the direction, the trajectory of American history. And, um, and so that is a, a matter of, of bipartisan concern, although we do see this asymmetrical alignment around an unsupportable idea of restricting. It's not America uh, of uh, by and for all the people, it's America for some of the people, it's America by certain people. Uh, and, um, and, you know, the naked, some of the naked racial uh, animus is just uh, just horrifying. Um, so that is going to put some pressure, though. And we heard this. We heard a strong endorsement from Senator Klobuchar. If I remember, he says, no, we're going to get all 50 of us in a room and we're going to make a deal and we're going to do that deal. Um, Norm Ornstein, in that room, they're going to push back on the notion of shrinking the bill. I know some of those senators, we talked about this on the first panel, the organic or philosophical connection. I'm not going to ask about those questions. It's very hard to know, particularly before we see uh, Senator Manchin's hotly awaited op-ed tonight that is going to articulate his position on what he will and will not support. But I am going to ask about the pressure on the filibuster because I have experts and those who've written uh, about the um, uh, about the filibuster, um, the uh, um, uh, let's talk about the options uh, for what the options might be. Of course, there's the maximalist option, which I believe you will not get a mansion to agree to. We're just going to do away with it for everything. That's not how the Senate works. The Senate is an incrementalist institution. It's not how filibuster reform has worked. They dropped from 67 to 60. They made an adjustment for the bird rule, for a budget reconciliation. They made an adjustment for federal judges. Then they made another baby step for Supreme Court uh, justices. They made an adjustment for um, executive personnel. So if you look at the history of it, it's incremental. And you look at Manchin, who I sat a few feet away from during the first impeachment, and I often kibitzed with. Uh, I don't take uh, uh, Manchin to be one who's going to throw it out. So you should feel free to disagree with that. But I want to talk about the um, some of the options. And I'm going to start with Rayshon, because he's advocated an idea in his writing of a kind of, which I have also, full disclosure, argued for, which is to, to have a topical, a civil rights exception or a voting exception or a democracy exception. That is, if we have a budget exception for uh, that we call reconciliation, couldn't we also have another substantive for something that's even more fundamental than money, than budgets, which is how, um, which is American participation in policy formation at the ballot box and the like. So Rayshon, talk about that idea and tell us if you think it has a ghost of a chance. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear what, what Norman and Molly think about whether or not it has a chance. It should have a chance. And you just talked about that we have it set up for other sorts of things. Essentially what I'm arguing for and what I wrote in one of my recent Brookings pieces is to have uh, a civil rights exception. And part of this is, is important because we have to think that some of our elected officials who kind of nostalgically draw upon the past and selectively draw upon it, oftentimes are not equipped to objectively make decisions about our country's present 
and our country's future, particularly when it comes to civil rights and even more specifically when it comes to racial progress. And part of what we're seeing right now from the, the roughly 250 uh, proposed bills across the country, I believe it's well over 40 states, like 43 states at this point, aiming to roll, roll back uh, progress as it relates to voting. When we look at the Shelby versus Holder case, over 1,000 polling places closed overwhelmingly in Black and Latino areas and low-income areas. But we also have to be clear that thinking about civil rights and thinking about those protections and what they might look like, it could be narrowly defined to say focus on issues that address race. And I think part of what HR1 is aiming to do is to ensure that there is some sort of federal oversight that prevents that. As we know from South Carolina to North Carolina to Georgia, we see that happening. And Georgia is interesting, not only because the Senate flipped, but because many of us saw this coming. And part of it is about a great migration and a return back to the South. If we just look at Georgia alone, uh, a few decades ago when I was growing up there, it was about 1.8 million black people, so less than 2 million. Now it's well over 3.5 million black people hmm. living in the state of Georgia. That's not even including Latinos and Asians. So part of it is what um, unfortunately some Republicans are looking at are racial demographic shifts. And part of what they're doing is, is they're trying to, and, and honestly, they're not even hiding it. I mean, it's just very clear that a lot of these legislations, I mean, one, one basic one that as, as a, a person growing up in the South, thinking about how many people go to church, black, white, or otherwise, that all of a sudden you can't vote um, or that they're alleging they're trying to pass legislation that you can't vote on Sundays after church. I mean, that, that's pretty interesting to me because it speaks to the way that they're trying to double down to prevent this because they know through the week that if people's employers don't allow them to go vote, then it's gonna be more difficult for them to do so. So this civil rights exception, would be something that could be tailored to specific types of legislation that is going to disproportionately impact, even specifically when it comes to race, certain racial groups. And we know that when it comes to voting, that that is a big thing that's happened. I mean, again, I just wanna stress that even with all of these bills being presented, even with a thousand polling places over the past decade or so closing, we've still had more people come out to vote. And interestingly, these, Recent uh, waves of voting also help Republicans. They help people living in rural areas, help people who are elderly, help people living in the Great Plains. But of course, one thing that some Republicans know, well, pretty much all of them know, is that oftentimes when you reduce voter turnout, they are more likely to have a better chance of winning instead of realizing that there are new voting blocks that are forming they are looking for allegiances. They, they haven't exactly found that with, with the Democratic Party. So they're looking at the Republican Party and instead of the Republican Party reaching out to them, they're simply trying to stop them from coming to the polls. Um, uh, Molly, what are the prospects of getting that through or of getting some other modification? And then we'll come to Norm to talk about his proposed package of fixes and whether they can really work. Yeah, so I think one kind of big picture um, thing to remember when we think about changes to the filibuster and Norm, your kind of rundown of some of the ones that we've seen um, over the past half century is that historically when we see a change the way the filibuster works, it really is connected to a particular policy question. And I don't necessarily, I mean, the um, uh, Rashan's idea about um, using the Senate's, uh, making a change to the Senate's precedents that would um, carve out an exception for particular types of legislation, like that's one way that they're connected very literally. But even more generally, when we think about, say, the 2013 change to the way the filibuster works for nominations, that was a, an issue where over the course of um, a number of years really coming to a head through the first 10 months of 2013, you got increasing frustration in the Democratic caucus about something that Democrats wanted to do, confirm um, particularly appeals court nominees, particularly ones to the DC circuit, and Republicans were stopping them from doing that. And so it, the, the, the pressure built and built and built until you got agreement among enough Democratic senators to make the change. And so as we think about whether um, any kind of filibuster uh, change is really in, in the works, we have to ask ourselves, 
how and on what might we get that kind of, um, in this Senate, unanimous support from Democrats to make the change. And so could it be that um, you, you kind of build the support around something related to voting rights um, and make some sort of change? Possibly. Could it also be that there's something else that, that we're not talking about in this particular conversation that, that builds enough pressure to make a change? Um, uh, in, in an analogy I like to use that breaks the dam on the filibuster. And then there are other things that, that flow through more easily after, after the, the dam has been broken. I don't know, but we really do have to ask these questions about how to connect and how might we connect a procedural change and a particular policy outcome to understand what might happen. Um, it, it feels to me, it feels a little bit more like that um, critical mass is accumulating uh, almost analytically we see it but it's like the barometric pressure of policy of the need for a policy change is rising 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 and the naked brazen uh nature of some of these asymmetrical assaults on voting the timing is is ill-timed again i'm not going to endorse or if you want to know what I think about the underlying policies, look at our report. If it ain't broke, fix it. I'm not going to endorse particular pieces of legislation. But the nakedness and the timing, exactly, it's almost as if the advocates, those who do seek to pass H.R. 1 and the fix to the Voting Rights Act that's needed after John Roberts' Shelby County decision, which is included in H.R. 4, uh, which will be coming down the pike, it's almost as if they're attempting to call the question with their uh, uh, brazen uh, and and openly uh, partisan and racially motivated uh, legislative package, some more so, some less around the country, all in the total absence of fraud. Norm Ornstein, you very influentially written, and I think Senator Manchin has called you out uh, either by name or certainly the textures of the policies, um, and he's nodded at Rayshon and my idea of democracy uh, reconciliation as well by saying on Meet the Press that reconciliation type remedies might be considered. If you look closely at his colloquy with Chuck Todd, he says at the end, before we turn to reconciliation for HR1, he knows it's not a budget bill, uh, viewers. But Norm, really the focus has been on those remedies that you advocated um, in uh, your Washington Post piece, uh, which which um, I'm going to ask you to go through, including restoring a true talking filibuster, changing the presumption on voting, requiring the senators who are stalling the Senate to be present for protracted periods of time, all of them, a sufficient number to sustain um, uh, to sustain uh, the procedures. Um, would you talk about those a little bit and explain how that could solve the problem? Because if Strom Thurmond, I've never had a catheter mentioned on a Brookings seminar before, that may be a first in the storied history, century <laughs> plus history of this institution. But if Strom Thurmond could do that, Lindsey Graham has already said he wants to take up Strom's mantle for good and for ill, right? I, that's not something that you should be proud of, but he said he's going to do that. He's going to talk till he drops. So how will the things that you've proposed help? What are they and how do they get us uh, through the present crisis? I will say, Norm, I'd pay a lot of money to see Lindsey uh, drop uh, on the Senate floor, but that's an another story. Um, you know, uh, John I, Lewis would disapprove of I know, you. I know. Uh, I'm going to tell well, a John Lewis story. I didn't until have time drops. on the first. Yes. I didn't have um, time on the first panel. So, the, you know, first, a, a couple of broader comments. One is the, the interaction between norms and rules um, and a different kind of norms than you or me. Uh, you know, when the rule was changed in 1975, they moved uh, to a, an absolute standard, uh, not a present and voting standard. And that meant that uh, effectively the burden shifted entirely to the majority, but nothing of great consequence happened for decades thereafter because Senators abided by the norms. They only used filibusters rarely for issues of great national significance. 
And of course, over many, many decades, we've had majorities frustrated at times and talking about maybe we should get rid of it, but never anything serious in the overall way. Then came Mitch McConnell. And starting in the last two years of the George W. Bush administration, when it was a Democratic Senate and Republicans didn't want legislation passed that President Bush would have to veto that might be embarrassing. So they filibustered a lot of things. But when Barack Obama became president, they used the filibuster as a weapon of mass obstruction. Nominations, including some that were ultimately passed unanimously, small bills, big bills, they used it to take up floor time and in a fashion that hadn't happened before. And as Molly alluded to, when Harry Reid changed the rule for nominations to move to a, a majority standard, still it can be filibustered, but it only takes 51 votes to overcome it. It was because McConnell went to him and said that the second most important court in the land, the DC circuit, which handles cases involving the presidency and uh, executive power and relations between the branches, which had had a conservative majority and had many vacancies, he basically told Harry Reid, we will not let anybody be confirmed for any of those positions, no matter how qualified, no matter how much there is a need and forced Reid to act the way he did. So now we're in a different place. And uh, it's a place where there's an enormous agenda waiting of urgent national needs. And it's very clear that the strategy that was used and worked in the first two Obama years and then in the first two years of his second term to try and block as much as you can and delegitimize what you can is gonna be applied again. But here we have to be pragmatic. What can you do that will change the rules, knowing we've got a way to do it with just 51 votes, 50 votes, that is gonna get those 50 votes among the 50 Democratic senators. And it's not just Joe Manchin. Manchin's become the flashpoint, but, and it's Kristen Cinema has been the second one, Kristen Cinema. but we have Angus King, we have uh, Dianne Feinstein, we have John Tester, and we have uh, others who are a little reluctant to make big changes. So the first thing I focused on is what objections do senators like that have to eliminating the filibuster, to changing the rule? How can you meet those objections? And what can you do to restore the dynamic where the burden as it ought to be is on the minority and where it's extremely difficult, not just to delay action, but to kill it entirely? For a long time, I've promoted the idea to start with because it's simple and elegant and it doesn't alter things dramatically, except it does, that instead of 60 votes being required to stop debate, and Norm, you will remember well that one instance on the Senate floor when there were 60 Democrats, but Robert Byrd, who had served more than 50 years in the Senate, was on his deathbed, almost literally, and McConnell wouldn't give any kind of exception and they had to pull him back from a gurney to a wheelchair onto the Senate floor where he shook his fist at Republicans, a man who had long championed the filibuster and the sanctity of the Senate and shouted, shame, shame, shame. That's not how it's supposed to work. Move it to 41 required to continue debate. And if you have that kind of a standard, then you can go around the clock for days on end you can have sessions on weekends, on Mondays and Fridays, and they're going to have to show up. Now, if you only did that, of course, there's still a heavy burden on the majority. They're going to have to show up as well because you're going to have to get a quorum. Now, uh, Al Franken had this uh, great anecdote early in his Senate career. Uh, he turned to a Republican colleague and said, see you on Monday. And the Republican said, well, I don't have, I don't have to be here. It's a, a, a cloture vote. Uh, you have to be here because it was only on the majority. They only needed a couple of Republicans to stick around to deny unanimous consent and call for quorum calls. Make it on the minority, but I would also pair it with that talking filibuster idea that Jeff Merkley has championed for a long time. Make it so that you have to have 41 senators on the floor who will continue the debate. And if they fall below 41 at any time, you move to a vote and a simple majority can pass it. Second idea, another possibility, which is a less heavy burden even, is just to say we're going back to a present and voting standard. 
so that instead of three-fifths of the whole Senate, it's three-fifths of those present and voting. So imagine if you go round the clock and the 87-year-old uh, Chuck Grassley, an 86-year-old um, uh, Dick Shelby, an 87-year-old uh, senator from Oklahoma are going to have to sleep on lumpy cots and get up at three in the morning to cast the votes and the like. If 20 of them don't show up and there are only 80 senators there, you only need 48 to invoke cloture and move to a vote. And then you could reduce the standard to 55. I'd be happy to make it 55 present in voting or to flip it around, 45 required to continue debate. But make it so that there's a heavy burden on the minority. And if we do some of those things, and by the way, it's not mutually exclusive to have a separate category for election or voting issues. I wouldn't uh, actually, Rashawn, make it about uh, race alone. The Constitution specifically gives Congress the authority to regulate the time, manner, and place of federal elections, have a reconciliation type measure for election issues, but change the filibuster so that we're back to having the burden on the minority. And if we could go even further, I'd be very happy with uh, Tom Harkin's idea, former senator from Iowa, that you have a period of two or three weeks and you gradually reduce the standard from 60 to 57 to 54 to 50 uh, so that the minority has time. You can bring the place to a halt. You can discuss these issues, try and rally the public behind you so you can't get 50 votes for something, but that ultimately the majority can rule, which is what the framers had in mind for the Senate, not what we have now. Uh, we have brilliant questions queuing up and the questioners got a little short shrift in the first panel just because it's uh, such a historic day on the hill. Our senators had to scramble off. So I'm going to come to Molly first uh, with uh, with these uh, with these questions. Um, the, the first batch is is uh, such a good one. Let me find it here. Letty is sending these, yes, here it is. Letty's sending them to me in the chat. Um, uh, Molly, if the filibuster is modified to pass S1, whether it's on a sliding scale over time with a, a subject matter exception that is the equivalent of reconciliation uh, or otherwise, how concerned would, should we be about the impact? This is what I hear the most particularly from genuinely bipartisan and GOP friends who, who want reform, but are concerned about the backlash. How concerned should we be about the impact once the Senate flips in the future, which we know uh, always happens. The Senate rotates through the two parties in power. Yeah, so I think this, I mean, this is a thing you hear a lot of folks ask when thinking about change to the filibuster, what about the, what about the future? And what I always come back to is that when we look at in contemporary American politics, kind of what Democrats want to do when they have power and can govern versus what Republicans want to do when they have power and can govern, much more of the Republican agenda can be done already in ways that do not require overcoming the threat of a filibuster. So oh. Republicans, as we saw during the Trump administration, you can confirm federal judges without the threat of, um, or without needing to get to 60 votes to end debate. Um, you can cut taxes without needing to get to 60 votes uh, to end debate because you can do tax cuts through the reconciliation process. For Democrats, um, there are lots and lots of things that Democrat that are important to Democrats that they want to do that they can do through the reconciliation process. I mean, the American Rescue Plan is a, a shining example of this. Um, this is especially true because of how much um, social policy we now deliver through the tax code. So as we've moved to the the tax code as our one of our primary mechanisms for um, for delivering benefits, um, you can do more and more things through reconciliation. But there's a lot that the existing budget reconciliation process can't touch um, that is important to Democrats is a big important share of the Democratic agenda and so as we as we think about um, this this question we kind of have to balance that and say what are the are are the things that um, are so important including things that are paramount like ensuring people have access to the ballot box are 
are getting those done uh, worth making changes to the way the Senate's rules work? And ultimately, that's a question for 50 Democratic senators. Uh, but that that's how I think about this question and about looking kind of over the, the medium term and the possibility of changes in the majority. Um, uh, the next question was really a fascinating one to me, and I'm going to uh, put it out to the put it out to the panel uh, just for a quick answer. It's from our friend Danny Kaufman, uh, 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 who works in the uh, um, space of global anti-corruption work, uh, has been an important participant, and is a uh, uh, Brookings one of our Brookings colleagues. The USA stands near the bottom among industrialized countries in registered voters as a share of population. And of course, uh, for the People Act addresses this uh, with automatic voter registration and other voter registration enhancements. Is there interest in Congress to draw from the many things that other countries have done well? Norm Ornstein, how interested is Congress in learning from the lessons of our uh, fellow democracies around the world? Not interested enough uh, is the fundamental answer. Uh, you know, there was an allusion today, at least, to universal voting by Republicans who trashed it. Um, I, along with uh, the great Brookings scholar E.J. Dion and many others, are part of a universal voting working group. And we are very much enamored of the Australian experience, uh, which is mandatory attendance at the polls. It is not a requirement to vote. Uh, you can go and just cast a ballot for none of the above, um, or what they call a null ballot. Uh, but if you don't show up and you don't have an excuse, I was sick, I was traveling, you're subject to a small fine, roughly $15. They get over 90% uh, turnout in their elections. And one of the great benefits is, uh, you know, turnout alone doesn't indicate a health in a democracy. Uh, the former Soviet Union had 99% uh, turnout, but uh, it changes the way people look at their politics. You're not trying to suppress votes. You're not trying to uh, keep your uh, opponent's base from turning out while you try and scare your own. Uh, and so you appeal to the uh, persuasive, uh, persuasible voters in the middle. Um, and uh, persuadable voters in the middle. Um, we, we have some support, bills have been introduced, but not much has been done. We should note that many of the reforms in the past, uh, including the secret ballot, uh, the Australian ballot, as it's called, um, came from abroad. So we've drawn on other experiences in the past, uh, but we're not as likely to do it now. And that's to the detriment of a country that is falling deeply in terms of international esteem uh, or looking at us as a role model for anything in this front. And in Russia of your, the Soviet Union, they uh, reported 99% turnout, no matter what the actual turnout was. One of the, one of the wisest, since we're on the topic, one of the wisest reflections on American democracy is uh, attributed to Stalin. It might be apocryphal. Uh, he supposedly said in democracy, it's not the votes that counts, it's who counts the votes. And I think that is, the, that is uh, one of the theses. And on the question of who counts the votes, Rayshon, reverting to your um, thoughts about a civil rights exception. Um, what do you think the prospects are for the return in possibly in HR4, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act, the return of pre-certification for changes to voting like we used to have in areas historically hostile to full voting rights, places where there has been demonstrated racial discrimination on the base of voting. And that terrible Shelby County case, I mean, how many times do these jurisdictions have to prove the reasoning of the majority wrong? Just look at what's happening today. I've been getting bulletins on the, the fate of uh, S SB 202 in Georgia, you know, cutting back Dropbox availability criminalizing giving waters to voters in long lines, mandating unneeded identification 
for vote by mail when there's no, <laughs> no incidents of fraud. We all know what's going on here. Uh, what about the prospect of getting preclearance back? Do you think that could move through Congress this year in this uh, historic moment that Senator Klobuchar was talking about where one party does have control of the White House and both houses of Congress? Well, I think there are a lot of people who definitely hope that's gonna be the case. I mean, part of the pre-certification process is to ensure that um, any sort of bias or discrimination is not embedded in the decisions that are being made. And we know overwhelmingly, not just in the South, but throughout the country with the number of bills that have been presented to try to block people from getting to the polls, that that is what's going on. And I mean, of course, we've talked a lot about the Shelby versus Holder case. I mean, it continues to be a pinnacle of what's going on. And thinking about uh, the, the legendary John Lewis and what's happening in his state. Um, interestingly, you know, I find it interesting what happened with the 2020 election for Georgia as well as for Arizona and the fact that, that we lost two giants in McCain and, and Lewis and, and the way that those states responded in that moment. I, I felt like that, that was something to, to really think about. And, and so, I mean, look, that preclearance is, is highly significant for ensuring that people have equitable access to the polls. And part of what that means is that whenever people are aiming to make changes, whether that be with drop off boxes or even, and what this is, this is the key point that people have to recognize. These little things that seem minuscule to a lot of people gives certain people the ability to justify the removal of people who fairly and legally cast their ballots. That's one of the things that people have to, have to recognize is that it leads to a level of doubt. And look, again, if we saw with the 2020 election where people across the country were coming out, I mean, it becomes important that we ensure equity, that we ensure fairness, and that we ensure that everyone has the ability to get to the polls in an equitable way. And one thing that I would bet, and I, and I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of focus on Georgia and rightfully so, but as I mentioned earlier, that population change one of the things that I'm starting to look at is whether or not we're seeing states across the country where we're seeing massive uh, demographic changes, not just race, but also in terms of how we think about class, how we think about age, whether or not we're seeing those states double down even more on voting restrictions. So, I mean, when it comes to, to H.R. 1, when it comes to H.R. 4, I mean, of course, um, the late Congressman John Lewis, these were things that he, uh, that he fought for valiantly. And, and I know that people in the Senate are really looking at it closely. I Norm, promised. Let me, let me yeah, just go add, ahead, Norm. Yeah, a couple of things. First is, uh, as Rayshon said, we're seeing this in Iowa. We're seeing this in Arizona. We're seeing it in states across the country. And frankly, what I would do with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is I would make preclearance apply everywhere. Uh, one of the concerns, of course, that was raised by Roberts was that it was unfairly singling out areas uh, that uh, didn't deserve it. Of course, he said absurdly because they had shown that there was no longer any discrimination. And as uh, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg noted in her uh, 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 plea on the other side and her dissent, that's like saying in the middle of a driving rainstorm, I don't need my umbrella anymore. I'm not getting wet. Uh, so I'd apply it everywhere. And if we change the filibuster rule and make it a 41 rule, and they're going to have to go around the clock and change it so that the debate on it has to be germane, no more reading the phone book or reading green eggs and ham, uh, let them argue over and over again why they're for discrimination on the basis of race and voting. The beauty of the idea you had of a kind of sliding scale of uh, votes as the days and even weeks pass is it creates um, an opportunity. Um, if you limit it to substantive debate, it actually creates an opportunity to talk about ideas, but also a space to negotiate. And there's no, in my view, there's no good faith basis. Uh, you know, the, the empirical propositions that were advanced by John Roberts, um, uh, who is a man of good faith, um, even he must now realize that the reality of the naked voter suppression, so often discriminatory that we see in our country puts the lie to the reasoning of that bill. But we would be safer if it were universally applicable. You'd have to expand the Justice Department Civil Rights Division considerably. It would be nice, by the way, if Congress would 
Congress would accelerate uh, some of the very badly needed nominees to, in the middle of a voter suppression crisis around, around the country uh, to oversee that work. Let me um, come to Molly. Molly, oh, I wanted to tell my John Lewis story. When I was doing the impeachment, um, it took, John was a very old friend and, and colleague uh, and wonderful. He took the interest uh, to give me uh, career advice from time to time. And when we were doing the impeachment, he announced his, um, he announced his uh, support for impeachment. It wasn't right away. It was um, in the fall of, um, of, of my, the year that I worked um, as impeachment co-counsel. And then he approached me afterwards in the tunnels. We were walking through the tunnel between the Rayburn and the Capitol. And um, uh, the Rayburn office building where my office was. And uh, I thanked him for his vote. And he grabbed me with that steely grip that he had. He grabbed me by my arm and he said, Norm, impeach him, but do it with love. So I know Norm the Elder was joking when he says, let them debate until they drop. But I think it is very, I think the lessons of that generation as we focus on this great fight for social justice and for voting equity in America, that we take the lessons of that uh, generation to heart. I do look forward to having a month long debate on voting rights, however, that I do look forward to. Um, okay, Molly, I wanted to come to you um, as we do the last round of questions to focus on something that Senator McConnell said um, this week um, it might have been at the end of last week. He said, if, because he also feels the tectonic plates shifting. And he, and you're seeing, and now there are press reports that there is a nationwide campaign. Senator Cruz, Alec, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council has gotten involved. There's nationwide campaign to try to stop. Trump at CPAC said, uh, this bill is a monster. Um, and uh, McConnell got on the floor and he gave a speech. Molly he says, we, if they do this, we will grind the Senate to a halt. You need unanimous consent for everything. And you can't even turn on the lights without unanimous consent. I'm paraphrasing, I think. Um, uh, and um, what can he do that? One of our uh, uh, Gary Kahn asks. Can he actually do that? What will happen if he tries and how can it be addressed? So there are certainly things that Republic that, you know, if Democrats chose to make some sort of change to how the filibuster works, whether it's to try and reinstitute a, a talking filibuster all the way to uh, partial or full abolition, there are certainly things that Republicans can and I would expect would do in, in retaliation. You know, the kinds of things like when during the debate over the American Rescue Plan, Senator Ron Johnson insisted the entire text be read on the floor. Um, one uh, sort of like response is do we actually, how, how far do we think that they would would push that. Um, you know, McConnell has in the past threatened to retaliate when Repub uh, excuse me, when when Democrats made procedural changes, and then Republicans have not in entirely followed through on that. What as um, uh, as I, I Norm was talking about earlier, you know, there are some things that one or a few senators can do, but to kind of really push this to its logical limit, you need the whole caucus to buy in um, and to be willing to engage in some of these tactics. And so uh, I, I don't know what uh, what would happen. And, um, you know, I think that, again, if we look back at the history of, of the filibuster and change in, in this area, we it really is kind of a, a tit for tat. So one party does something, the other party responds. And so um, I don't I don't think we'd stay at a, an equilibrium where, um, you know, they're demanding uh, roll call votes on turning the lights on forever. Um, but I, I mean, I think it could get um, it could get pretty thorny, um, at least for um, a short period of time until kind of Democrats figure out what their um, response would be. And it just all again comes down to what do, Demo what do 50 Democratic senators think is worth making a change to the way the Senate works in order to do? And do they all agree on what that thing is? Well, uh, I have to say uh, that I take Senator Klobuchar at her word 
the, as we call it, the Minnesota mafia, they all seem, I don't know how it is that everybody in Minnesota, I mean, it's not a small state. You all seem to know each other, Nora Mornstein. Uh, I take her at her word uh, when she says they're all going to get in a room and they're going to figure it out. If you look at the career of, um, if you look at the career of um, Senator Manchin, um, you know, he's very dedicated to that. When when we were doing, I'll tell another impeachment story and then I'll, I'll do the last question. He approached me when we were doing the impeachment and he's, he was trying to get a compromise going. He said, look, you are not going to get the votes. It's on the floor of the Senate, the trial. You're not going to get the votes to impeach Donald Trump. So why don't you do a censure instead? And he had two versions. And he said, I wrote about this in my book. He's not mad at me for saying so. He says, I have the ass kicking version here, the hard version of the censure. And I have the ass kissing version here, the softer version of the center. You can pick. Okay. And I told him, you know, the Democrats were very concerned that that would be a safety valve. Um, and I, and, and I said, well, if you can get one Republican to co-sponsor with you, you know, we can have a very serious talk about this. He could not get a single member because of the asymmetry. It would have been such a logical resolution uh, where you clearly did not have the votes to convict Donald Trump on the articles of impeachment in the first impeachment. Uh, but it shows, and he didn't give up. He was pushing and trying, and he really was a caucus of one. And of course, did the did the right thing in the end, which not popular with all of his constituents. I think he will find a way to get to yes here um, and to keep the organic. I hope it will keep the organic core um, uh, of um, uh, of the policy reforms that are needed, whether or not this bill. Uh, again, I'm not neither endorsing nor opposing particular legislation, but I think he he will get. Uh, to yes with his colleagues. So history is coming, friends. Um, I know I promised that I would do another round of questions, but they're furiously signaling me that we have used up our time. So I am going to, I could go with the three of you. We should have had the wit to schedule an after party and uh, continue the conversation for special friends. I could listen to the three of you and let's admit it to myself for hours. <laughs> uh, Ray Sean Ray, you are such a wonderful Brookings colleague uh, coming to us as the Rubenstein Fellow this year and your leadership with our, there's no think tank in the world, I think that does better, more cutting edge work on the equity issues that are necessary to fulfill the American dream. And you have been such a leader on that. I'm so proud to have you as a colleague and so grateful for your work on this panel. Mo Molly Reynolds, you're the model of what we love at Brookings. You started out as a research assistant. You got your PhD. Now you're a leading scholar of Congress and so much wisdom for us as we think about the fate of the filibuster. And to my older brother, uh, Norm, Norm the Elder, uh, what can I say? Thank you, not just for your leadership on this issue, for participating in our panel, but for all that you've done um, to uh, to help make our country a better place with sounder policy uh, in all of these areas for so many years, and for your wonderful mentorship and many kindnesses to me. And friends, I also want to thank all of you, thousands of you who joined today, dozens and dozens of members of the press, the public, experts from all over Washington, the nation, and, and I, I saw some folks coming in from all over the world. This is not only a matter of resolving these policy issues, as we explain in our Brookings report, if it's broke, fix it, is not only a matter, we have a section in there on the international impacts. It is not only a matter of fixing what is has been broken in America, in some cases since our founding, the discrimination that has been built into, into American voting, um, but it is a matter of American leadership around the world to address these policy questions. So we will all watch with the utmost interest uh, and the fate of S1 uh, the, and the conjoined fate of the filibuster, because it means so much to democracy in the United States and around the world. Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be back with another one of these as we track the progress 
of democracy legislation in the United States Congress. Molly's going to have another great panel coming up with our brilliant colleague, Sarah Binder. Stay tuned for more about that. And thanks for joining us today for these wonderful two panels. So long, everybody. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.